welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 35 of the Madden America podcast. This week, I'm delighted to have been able to chat with Dr. Duncan Double. Duncan is a consultant psychiatrist at the Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust. He is founder of the Critical Psychiatry Network and also runs a critical psychiatry blog. He edited the book Critical Psychiatry, The Limits of Madness, published in 2006, and has written a number of journal articles and book chapters. Dr. Double, thank you so much for talking with me for the Madden America podcast. To begin, I wanted to ask you a little about you and your background and what led you to become a consultant psychiatrist. Yes, thank you for inviting me to uh, to do this podcast. I'm a, I'm a semi-retired uh, consultant adult community psychiatrist and I still work uh, two days per week uh, based in Lowestoft in Suffolk in the UK. Um, I've also recently started a part-time PhD in psychology at Cambridge University, and I'm also trying to develop an institute of uh, critical psychiatry, although at the moment this is uh, little more than a web page. I had an interest in psychiatry through reading Freud as a teenager, um, and I was surprised when I uh, expressed an interest in being uh, a psychiatrist before university that I was told I needed to train in medicine. I went along with this, but actually found it difficult to uh, take to the overly uh, physicalist aspects of what I was expected to learn, when my primary interests were more personal. I uh, took the opportunity to use the third year of my training, which most students use to develop their interest in natural sciences, to do a year in religious studies, as at the time medical students had the opportunity at Cambridge to do any tripos in their third year. So that at least exposed me to the humanities as well as the sciences. Mm. And I was also taken up by public criticisms of psychiatry at the time, which were called anti-psychiatry. That's in particular the writings of R.D. Lang and uh, Thomas Sass. And I had a place at Newcastle University to start my clinical training after preclinical at Cambridge, but decided not to take it up giving up, I guess, in rather a confused state about where I was going uh, career-wise. So I was actually out of medicine for eight years and did various things in that time, including working with drug users in London, uh, working for social security, studying for a psychology degree. And as I was short of money, I ended up working for a bank for for four years, uh, which which I absolutely hated. Having taken a psychology degree, I'm working as a nursing assistant in a psychiatric death unit for a year. I then applied for clinical psychology training. And clinical psychology training is very uh, competitive. Uh, I mean, it's now still very competitive. And it was after my second interview, when I'd been turned down, uh, that was in Leeds, that I was given feedback that with the sort of views I had about psychiatry, that I would have more influence if I went back and finished off my medical training. And actually, that hadn't really occurred to me as such, Um, not least because I had three children by then. But that's what I did. I went back to uh, Cambridge to complete my medical training and started psychiatric training. I then finished my training as a lecturer in Sheffield. And I've now been a consultant for over 25 years. Thank you. And Duncan, you alluded to it there. You're an active critical psychiatrist, having been a founder of the Critical Psychiatry Network. And I can see how that may apply to academic settings. But I wondered if you could help me understand what being a critical psychiatrist means at a practical level. For example, does it fundamentally change your approach with your patients? Yeah. The Critical Psychiatry Network first met in January 1999. It's a small group. Uh, People are sometimes surprised how small it actually is. Uh, But we are a a group of uh, psychiatrists that are prepared to be critical about our own profession. Most psychiatrists believe that uh, mental illness is a brain disease. And my understanding of critical psychiatry is that it's saying that psychiatrists do not need to take this step of faith to practice. And not taking this step of faith has implications for the way psychiatrist practice. So we could look at this, uh, if you like, in relation to diagnosis and treatment. So firstly, diagnosis. Critical psychiatrists are not so interested in arriving at a single word diagnosis. If one doesn't believe that mental illness is a brain disease, there's no need to 
specify an underlying brain problem. Mm. Instead, the focus is on understanding the person and why they've presented with the problems they have in the context of their life situation. And then in relation to treatment, critical psychiatrists do operate within the framework of the Mental Health Act. They're not just uh, psychotherapists who see people on a voluntary basis, but they do try and minimize the use of coercion. And they've actually been against the introduction of community treatment orders. They do use medication, but they're skeptical about the evidence for its efficacy. And they're very aware of the risk of discontinuation problems from medication. They do facilitate people seeing psychotherapy if they wish. But in a way, the main emphasis in treatment is on helping people improve their social situation and to be as independent as they want to be. You can make too much of the difference from mainstream psychiatry. Psychiatrists do actually vary in the extent to which they are person-centered in their practice. However, few psychiatrists go as far as critical psychiatrists in giving up the disease model of mental disorder in their practice. Thank you. And I read that you endured a short period of suspension, which you described as deeply stressful and horrendous. And I get the impression that this was because you were partly at odds with a dominant paradigm in psychiatry. And I wondered if we could discuss that. Yes. Um, I mean, not actually sure how uh, short it was, really. It was six months, actually, which for me was a, was a long time. Um, but you're right. It was a, a shock to me to be suspended. I'd been practicing differently as a psychiatrist, being less concerned about formal diagnosis and probably using less medication than uh, than most psychiatrists without it causing any problems. So I think what happened is that critical psychiatry became defined and labeled. Uh, we'd formed the Critical Psychiatry Network in 1999. I'd actually earlier started a website, which was uh, initially called the Anti-Psychiatry Website. Um, okay, it was a mistake to call it that. Um, it does still exist, that website, as the Critical Psychiatry Website. But there is quite a history to anti-psychiatry, and psychiatrists still feel threatened by it. And because of my website, people began to gossip and wonder what I was up to. And there was a change of medical director in the trust I was working in. He was quite biomedical in his approach, and he thought it was his job to retrain me to do psychiatry properly. He only started to realize he'd made a mistake when he found out that the person he wanted to send me to for retraining in organic psychiatry was someone I'd used as a referee. Still, by this time, I'd been suspended six months, as I said. Um, I wasn't prepared to have any further investigation into my practice, needing to return to work. And as there'd been a loss of confidence in my practice, I agreed to work under the supervision of a colleague for a year. And I've still had to deal with the stigma, if you like, of that um, in many ways since. But I think we've now reached the stage where I would hope that critical psychiatry is more accepted and unlikely to be attacked in the, in the same way that I went through. Well, personally, I think in recent times I've seen more psychiatrists who are willing to speak out in a critical way about their own profession. But I guess that was more difficult to do even 10 or 15 years ago. Maybe. Um, um, I, I think critical psychiatry still got a, a long way to go and it is still a a minority interest. Thank you. And turning to that, I wanted to ask, what is the future for critical psychiatry? Can it ever hope to challenge the dominance of the biomedical model and the reliance on pharmacological intervention? I think critical psychiatry is still looking for more acceptance from the mainstream. Um, actually, my own view is that there's always been a, a critical element within, within psychiatry, and that's going all the way back to the 19th century, with the origin, origins of uh, psychiatry in the asylums, yeah? It's just that the, it's always been a minority view. I actually don't think there will be a major paradigm shift, um, and that's because the wish to, to find a physicalist basis for mental illness will never go away. However, if you look back at the history of psychiatry, there have been times when it has been more open-minded and pluralistic, and I think the development of pharmacological management from the middle of the 20th century and the development of brain Im imaging after that, I think those developments in particular have affected the way we tend to view ourselves. And this has created a very narrow way of looking at, looking at this. 
And it's very easy to be taken in by that uh, by that way of looking at things, which you could call a biomedical myth. Mm. I think this could change over time, although I'm not exactly sure how. And it's uh, it's certain the biomedical myth has been a very successful model. Um, you only need to look at the amount of funding going into uh, neuroscientific research and the profits of the pharmaceutical companies. Mm-hmm. So that uh, th- those vested interests are, are very difficult to, to overcome. Some time ago, I interviewed a previous student of yours who told me that what struck her about your practice was that in your wards, many of the beds were empty because patients were leaving in comparison to other wards where beds seem to be permanently occupied. And it struck me then that seeing mental disorders as acute or chronic really can change the approach taken. So how do you feel we should conceive of mental disorders? Um, It's actually some time since I uh, I worked on a ward. Mm. Uh, What actually happened a few years ago in the UK was that NHS adult psychiatrists were divided into community and and, and acute services. Mm. I actually chose to become a community consultant. So it's a colleague of mine that now looks after any of my patients that get admitted. But when I first started in psychiatry, I worked across both community and acute. And uh, it's uh, probably true that I did use beds less than most psychiatrists. And this is because I think it's important to encourage active active turnover of patients through a ward, emphasising a community perspective. But uh, this doesn't mean that inpatient admission is never required. And in fact, I tend to think that several NHS trusts uh, have reduced their beds too far. And people do need a safe haven sometimes. And as I've said before, I think there are occasions when the Mental Health Act is unfortunately needed. Uh, And that is primarily about admission to hospital. As for how I conceive mental disorder, I I mean, I've I've said that I don't view it as a brain abnormality. Mm. There are psychiatric symptoms that do have an organic cause, such as dementia and toxic confusional states. But the majority of psychiatric presentations are functional. So there's no structural abnormality in the brain. What we're pointing to when we identify mental disorder is that something has gone wrong with mental functioning. Mm. I mean, of course, there's going to be debate about what gone wrong might mean. But for some presentations, such as psychosis, in which somebody might lose contact with reality and may develop delusional fantasies and may be unaware that others do not perceive things in the same way as them, there might be more agreement that somebody like that is not in their right mind or insane or mad even. But other problems may be more on a continuum with ordinary ordinary experience. And I'm not necessarily uh, someone who avoids the term illness in relation to mental health problems. There are problems with uh, mental dysfunction and physical dysfunction, and there are parallels uh, between them. For a start, it's uh, it's often doctors that we think of uh, going to first when we have symptoms, whether they're physical or mental. And there's uh, considerable overlap between physical and mental symptoms. More or less any physical symptom can be mimicked by a, a mental disorder. And it's the doctor's training that should help them to determine what the underlying cause might be. Mm. And I do think... Uh, the more recent emphasis on recovery in mental health services has been helpful. Of course, this uh, shouldn't be taken to mean that, you know, everyone can get over all their problems. People need to be helped to be as independent as they're capable of uh, being and and want to be. And there's also a problem sometimes with the way the term recovery has been taken over in a biomedical context. However, primarily, the recovery approach, recovery approach is patient-centered, and it is a challenge to biomedical dominance, and it can be a useful way for people to view their mental health problems. Thank you, Duncan. And recently, you and I engaged on Twitter, where you helped me understand some of the nuances around medication use. So what is your own view and approach to medication for mental or emotional distress? I'm not so sure I, I actually help you uh, to understand about medication. As I said earlier, I I mean, I do use medication. However, I'm very aware that the evidence for psychiatric treatment is biased, and that's for methodological reasons. Treatments are tested in randomized controlled trials, 
in which the people in the trial do not know, or in other words, are blinded about whether they have received active or placebo treatment. And if people were not blinded in trials, we would not eliminate what are called expectancy effects as a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that people believe medication is going to be effective. And we would be uncertain whether any apparent improvement was real or merely due to placebo. The trouble is that randomized controlled trials are not always double blind, as they may seem. So, for example, uh, there was this uh, study published in the in the Lancet, and uh, it was comparing antidepressants. And I think it was this study that actually led to our Twitter conversation. Yes, that's right. And you've actually done a podcast recently with Joanna Moncrief about this. Mm. The authors of the study sold it to the media that their analysis proved that antidepressants are effective. But in fact, they were actually saying nothing new. We already know that the antidepressant trials find a statistically significant difference between antidepressants and placebo. What those who are sceptical about the efficacy of antidepressants point to is the bias in the data produced because studies are not as double-blind as is commonly assumed. So this could mean that a statistically significant difference is in fact an artifact. It's a very difficult hypothesis to prove. It's called the placebo amplification hypothesis. But because it's so difficult to prove, that's why it's so controversial. But to me, science is about being sceptical about the evidence. And because I'm sceptical, I like to think this makes me more honest with people about what the evidence actually shows. To continue to use the example of antidepressants, most people do not realize that even in clinical trials, the difference between active and placebo treatment is small. So on average, if maybe 60% of people are helped by antidepressants in the trials, 50% of people are helped by placebo. So that means that there are 40% of people who are not helped even in the clinical trials. And people are not always given this realistic way of looking at the evidence, and I think they should be. I'm also very aware of the problem of uh, discontinuation from medication. People form attachments to their medication, not always just to do with what's in the medication. It's not surprising to me that people may become dependent on it and therefore may have discontinuation problems. And doctors are very slow to recognize this and in fact may still tend to minimise discontinuation problems, and I don't think they should. Absolutely. And Duncan, you mentioned there the Lancet study, and there were some sensational headlines in the UK about up to a million more people could benefit from antidepressant treatment. So I just wondered about your reflection on those headlines. I think, um, obviously, their study was was what's called a meta-analysis of the acute treatment of of depression. Mm. Um, If you actually have a look closer in in the paper, you will see actually that they do give a more more balanced assessment of of the implication of that, because they say that there isn't as much evidence as we would like for long-term use of antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Whitaker, of course, who's, uh, who's, who's started the Madden America website has always emphasized that if you look closely at the evidence, what you might be able to infer, uh, again, it is open to to debate, but I think it is a debate which we should be having, which, uh, which doesn't happen. If you look at the evidence, there might be evidence that people actually do better in the long term without medication. And actually taking medication There's evidence that that can create a vulnerability to relapse. Now, you know, none of these things are absolutely clear. I'm I'm saying something very different from uh, the way the press actually reported that Lancet study. Um, There does need to be ongoing debate about about these things. Well, I'm grateful, Duncan, that yourself and Joanna and others are willing to add that critical and sceptical voice because for the uninitiated to read those headlines, you would think that there were nothing but benefits to antidepressants and there were no risks or concerns. And I think it's quite important that we are sceptical and cautious. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, Duncan, was there anything else that you'd like to discuss or share with the listeners? Um, 
I mean, would you, would you mind me giving some publicity to two aspects of my work? I, I actually run a critical psychiatry blog. I've been doing that for several several years now, and people are welcome to uh, comment on the blog. Um, some of the posts are, are quite academic, but actually, you know, I do believe there should be more public debate about uh, about these issues in psychiatry. Um, and secondly, I, I, I mentioned I'd like to develop uh, my Institute of Critical Psychiatry. Um, so if anyone uh, knows where I might be able to get some funding, um, I'd be very pleased to uh, to, to hear from them. Um, and then finally, I, I think I'd just like to thank you for allowing me to uh, to talk about my work and uh, and critical psychiatry in this podcast. Well, thank you, Duncan. It's been a pleasure to be able to talk today. Okay. All right. Bye. Well, I just want to thank Duncan for taking the time to talk with me. And if you'd like to read more on his blog, you can find it at criticalpsychiatry.blogspot.co.uk. So thank you for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.